Hi everybody, we're here at Cantor's Deli in LA with Mark Cantor himself. This is an infamous place. This is an infamous booth. And this man has an infamous story that he's told in Reckless Road, Guns N' Roses. His book that he's made, it's all photos and everything that Mark took throughout the years that they were forming, I guess, the first few years. Most of my questions to you at first are obviously going to be about Guns N' Roses, but I also want to know how you are still an untattooed, sober, alive man with a business and a normal life. How did you, how did you escape unscathed from this lifestyle that everybody else got involved with? Well, when we were teenagers, I grew up with Slash way before anybody was drinking or doing any drugs. I mean, back in 1976 when he was 11. So in 1976, I met Slash in grammar school in the fifth grade. He was actually trying to steal my mini bike. It was a motorbike, actually, with a lawnmower engine. And I was at a, a, a Kentucky Fried Chicken on 3rd Street, and he was walking by, saw it, and was thinking of stealing it. And he looked inside, <laughs> and he recognized me he didn't know me, but he recognized me from school. Like maybe he saw me. We were in the not the same. We were in the same grade, but not the same class. So maybe he saw me in the playground or whatever, and, or maybe we had some mutual friends. So he re realized he'd just come make friends with me, and he wouldn't have to worry about stealing it because I'd probably let him ride it. So that's how we met, and it turned out he only lived a block or two away from me. So we'd carpool to school. You know, we'd hang out. At some point, we started racing or riding bicycle, like bicycle motocross together. Yeah and still no drugs, no drinking yet. And, um, you know, we were just kids having fun. And I noticed that his artwork was really cool back then. Like he'd draw dinosaurs and snakes and with like animated, like Disney made it almost. Yeah. And he was really good on a bike and just you just knew something was just better. You know, he was built different than most people. Yeah. And uh, then I lost touch with him for about a year because we went to different uh, junior high schools uh, for one of the one of those years. And um, when I met up with him again around the end of the ninth grade, he was already playing guitar for about a year, and I was also playing guitar. And we were both interested in the same kind of music, you know, Aerosmith and Zeppelin and whatever. Yeah. And so he says, "Well, I, I got a, a show, a party, my first party coming up next week. You should come." So. I, of course, I started hanging out with him, going to his house, playing with guitar with him, and I noticed that he was like watching Jimi Hendrix or Eric Clapton. It just I, his talent had poured out through his guitar playing in that short time that he had been playing. So I used to actually document his art. I'd keep his artwork, and I kept his. I used to take pictures of him jumping off motocross jumps. So I started doing the same thing. I started, I'd go to the show and I'd record the show. I'd take pictures, keep the flyer. It was like I knew that there was something that was going to work with that. And then later, this was like in 1981. By 1984, 1985, we met Axel and Izzy and the other guys. And I noticed that they were a ke perfect chemistry between all of them. He wasn't the only monster. And now there was other monsters. And all these monsters are all together making monstrous music. Yes. And there was no songs that needed producing or more or throwing away and, and adjusting it. They were just ready to go. What they wrote is what you hear on Appetite for Destruction, even up, even down to the guitar solo. And um, I just made it a point to go to every single gig and document and record because I knew it was good and they were my friends. So it was fun for me. It was also my hobby. But I, at the same time, I knew that someday somebody might also want to see this because I knew it was going somewhere. Yeah, which people but as far and I, I never answered your original question about the drugs. <laughs> uh, by the time, not only by drugs, the, no like alcohol or whatever. But by the time like the tenth or eleventh grade came, Slash was already drinking alcohol. He wasn't doing drugs, but he was drinking alcohol on a regular basis. I wasn't. It just didn't. I tasted it, didn't like it, and whatever. I didn't do it, so I didn't have that those kinds of problems. But uh, later on, you know, through different people's girlfriends and stuff like that. Uh, mainly really Izzy's girlfriend was the one that kind of introduced the heroin around and they were, some of them were doing it. Duff was not because when he was 15 his girlfriend died in his arms. So he was scared straight as far as that goes. He might have done other things that weren't really good for you but he definitely didn't do the heroin. 
But I didn't approve of what they were doing, and I was helping them financially with food and flyers and getting to the next gig and equipment or whatever they might have needed, demo tapes, because I had a, a job. And they, they, you know, if, they, if there, some of them had a job, they still had to support themselves. I lived at home, so I didn't really have any bills. So, yeah. you know, 90% of my money went to backing them. The other 10% was for food or whatever else I needed. But That leads to my next question. How did your parents let you go out at the tender age of 15 with these people? Well, actually 16, 17 more was really the age, but uh, I used to borrow my dad, my mom and dad's station wagon to lug his equipment, slash his equipment, to late night rehearsals, because that was the cheapest rehearsal space we can get is at 3 in the morning, or I mean really at, at, at midnight, but until 2 in the morning. By the time I'd get home, it'd be 3 in the morning. Yeah. And it was like, you know, 5 bucks an hour or whatever, 10 bucks an hour. And um, that's what we did. But my parents didn't like it because I'd, I'd have to come to work at 7.30 in the morning, and so I was only getting three hours of sleep. But um, they they knew that I was going to do it anyway, so that was that. But then, you know, the, the band started the band started playing around little clubs and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. And the crowds got bigger, and then the record companies came around, and pretty soon they didn't really need my backing because the girl there were strippers coming around that were supporting them and then they got rec you know they found a management that supported them a little bit and got backing and then the record company came and gave them backing so I was just simply their friend no longer their backer at that point yeah. but uh, back to the drugs they were hiding it from me because I was like their mother they, they so knew your parents let you go out because they knew you were the good kid yeah I was a good kid and, and they would hide it from me and then they would try to get me to go buy them dinner after they were high and I'm like no because if I buy you dinner then the next time you get money, you're just going to get high again. So I, I, <laughs> I was not supporting that. The drinking was fine with me because that, they were going to do that anyways, and they were already addicted to that. So why well, say they slash anyways? Yeah. But um, after a very short period, though, when it, when it started getting bad for a couple of months, still be, you know, 1986, Axel was the one that that stopped cold. You know, and any whatever he was partaking in, he just stopped and was pissed off that they were not stopping. So he actually, he took the blame for a lot of stuff later on for, you know, all kinds of roses, drugs. But really, before they even made it, he was already not, you know, doing those things. Did they eat some of your delicious treats like this? Is that what kept them going? No, they would always come <laughs> here for food, and I would always feed them, of course, or bring food to them like a pastrami sandwich or corned beef or whatever they wanted. Did any they, of them ever work here? Slash worked here. <laughs> Slash worked here. Um, I, I created a job for him. He was kind of doing the waitress checks, um, putting them in order and making sure they all there wasn't missing checks and making sure they added them right. You know, I kind of created the job for him for like, you know, five bucks, six bucks an hour <laughs> back in the day just to get him a little pocket cash. Did you have to fire him or was he very good at that job? No, no, he, he found a real job. <laughs> <laughs> he worked at different places. Okay. How long has Cantor's been around for? Cantor's has been around, well, actually, it started, my grandparents and his brother started in New Jersey uh, in 1924, and then they moved here in Los Angeles in 1931 in Boyle, East L.A., which is Boyle Heights, and then in 1948, they moved to the Fairfax District, where we are now, and uh, so pretty much we've been... This, my side of the family anyways because there were some other brothers that didn't come this way they stayed back there and then their business eventually went out you know they closed it or sold it but um, we've been around here since 1948 on Fairfax that's amazing and now you run it or your parents no my parents are, are still alive of course and uh, my dad works very little bit uh, my sister's here my brother's here my cousins are here you know there's like five or six of us that help run it but the place sort of runs itself. There's 140 people that work here. Yeah. We Whoa. just take care of the major things. You That's know, a keep lot of people. I do maintenance like plumbing, refrigeration, electrical, just kind of keep the train on the track. Because yeah. it will go off the track. You walk in we met a Skip the other day. He's very nice. It's not going to go off the track with I'll him on board. <laughs> no, I, I mean, it's as simple as a drain that backs up or, or a, you know, just it could be a refrigeration or air conditioner or a toaster's broken or dishwasher's jammed. I mean, there's so many different things that can go wrong, and they do go wrong, or the oven stops working, that you just have to know all the tricks and keep all the parts to keep, you know, because 
this is America, and in America we don't stock parts anymore. So <laughs> if you wait for something to break and try to order the part, it could take you know six weeks to come. Yeah. And then what are you going to do for six weeks? So we keep spare parts for everything, just so we have them on hand. Did you ever want to be a rock star like all your friends of the day? No, well, I grew up li loving, you know, really obsessing on Aerosmith, so I learned how to play guitar, you know, they influenced me, but I never was good enough to do anything, like to play in a band or anything, just I knew the basic chords. Maybe I wrote a song or two or parts, you know, some riffs or whatever, but uh, I, I didn't have it that way, but it was, uh, it was fun to watch my friends be able to you know, peop we used to go to concerts together, and then all of a sudden they're playing concerts. So it was kind of fun for me to watch something that close to me make it. You know. Yeah. Did you still continue your Aerosmith collection? I st I still have my Aerosmith collection, oh, but I don't. You I kept adding to it. No, I, I stopped adding to it. <gasps> I stopped when I was about 19. I thought you might have a room out the back. My whole room was plastered, even the ceilings in Aerosmith. Every square inch was plastered. You still love them, though? No, yeah, of course, of course. How many times do you think you've seen Guns N' Roses? Well, before? in the club days, at least 50 times, because there's 50, there's 50 gigs in that book. But, but after they made it, I probably saw them another 20 times. You know, they'd fly me around sometimes to see different I, w I was at the giant I flew to giant stadium where they filmed Paradise City yep. not because they were filming Paradise City I didn't even know they were going to film Paradise City that day I went because um, Deep Purple was on the bill it was Aerosmith Deep Purple and Guns N' Roses three of my favorite bands <laughs> so we Deep Purple was not on that tour they just were put on for that one gig because yep. it was a, a big stadium and uh, so I flew out for that one. You know, I, I, they flew us out to a couple of ones in, in Cleveland or, you know, Axel flew us to Rio, my wife and I. So just different, you know, we've, every time they come here, they, I saw them four nights at the Forum and you know, in 91 on that Use Your Illusion tour and a couple of times in 92 at, you know, the Rose Bowl and the Coliseum and that kind of stuff. So I don't know, maybe 15 times wow. after that. It says in here that it's either in here or Mick Wall's book that you're kind of in sixth member of Guns N' Roses because you were with them so much and well, Duff actually says it in my book he says I was like the, when the band first formed I was like the sixth member of the band because I was always around yeah. I cared what they were doing I was at the rehearsals and I was helping them financially and food wise or just moral support you know my opinion whatever so even though I didn't play the music or write the music, I was there while it got written, and yeah. I was there while they performed things for the first time, and I helped them get to the next gigs uh, in a lot of ca in many cases with flyers and you know whatever it took. So I was part of it. I was part of the gang. Did you ever act as stylist to these boys? Act how? Stylist. Did you choose oh. the Atlas chat? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did. I did. I, I, just, I was. I've always been myself. You know, just kind of showed. I am who I am, and that was it. I didn't dress the part or look the part, or I'm just me. <laughs> I love. I think that's why I wanted to talk to you so much because it's such a lifestyle that everybody, even the fans, like that's. It's all the buzz. They dress the same. They got excited, and you came through unscathed, but still really good friends and. You've got this amazing document, but you were a good kid, and you've got a business and stable, and... I had a pair of leather pants, if that's what you mean, but... <laughs> does that count? You knew no. there must be something. No, that doesn't count. But, um, dun, dun, dun. I actually... <laughs> my wife used to cut their hair at the same time I was doing all that, but I, she wasn't my wife yet. She was just a girl, but I knew her anyways, and so now she's my wife, but... So that's kind of a small world, but... Um, and, and we were the ones that were the quiet ones. We didn't do anything bad, you know? Yeah. <laughs>